Why is this new thing, SSI and verifiable credentials, taking off? What is what is behind it? So I always start out my explanations by saying, look, we have a way of doing what is widely known as self-sovereign identity today, and it's using wallets. It's using credentials in wallets that we carry with us, and those credentials are decentralized, meaning, yes, there's some issuer of a credential someplace, but there's no one issuer of all credentials every place. Anyone can be an issuer of a credential you would put in your wallet. Anyone can have a wallet that will hold the credentials that they're issued, and they can go to any, uh, the third parties called a verifier, to who says, okay, if you can show me a credential that I can verify, then I will give you uh, access to something. Uh, you can get on a plane at an airport, you can uh, get a hotel room, you can rent a car, you can do all the things that you need to prove some aspect of your identity for. So what we don't have is a way to do this on this, right? We don't have the digital way to do this. We cannot um, turn around and prove those same things we can do in seconds in the offline world with uh, online. We can, we have what we call today account-based identity. We go to a site, we register an account, we have username and password or some of the combination of multi-factor authentication. We can prove to that site it's really us coming back. But I can't go to uh, a banking site and prove who my employer is. Uh, I can't go to a school and prove that I've lived in a certain city or what my social security number is or, you know, other things like that. It, it's just, it, instead, I have to give a set of data to um, uh, the site and they've got to go to some third party service or out, you know, onto the, um, the world of data brokerage and try and verify that information. Of course, because that data is what I'm using to prove who I am. That's what makes that data so valuable in the black market. That's why when databases of personal data are hacked, we have such rampant identity theft because all you need is that data to then assert, yeah, I am that person. I know all this information. Well, that's just, it's, it's broken. It's been broken for years and we're finally going to do something about it at a very low level of infrastructure. What's behind the, the, the use of credentials of any kind but when it comes to digital credentials, uh, which, uh, which are called, um, the term has become verifiable credentials, as in you can digitally verify uh, the credential, is this thing called the trust triangle. And the three major roles are the issuer is the, you know, the one who issues the credential, holder, it goes into their wallet, and then the holder pr uh, 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 presents what we call proof of that credential to a verifier. And the reason, you know, when we present a credential today, if I go to an airport, I would just, you know, pull out uh, a, uh, a driver's license or a passport to get on a plane, I'm presenting the whole credential. And uh, the TSA agent is verifying the whole thing. And if they've got a great memory, they can actually literally memorize everything that I'm, I'm putting in front of them. With digital credentials, one of the advantages are they can reveal only what the verifier needs to know. And they can use various types of cryptography to do that. It's called in the world of privacy, selective disclosure or minimal disclosure. Much better privacy, actually better security at the same time. And it can be just as easy as just saying, yep, you need to see this. Yes, I authorize it. And uh, the information is, is transferred. You'll note it that what's in the center of this that makes it all work is uh, the uh, blockchain or distributed ledger component. It's in the uh, specification uh, from the W3C for verifiable credentials. It's called a verifiable data registry. That's a generic term for any um, uh, piece that sits in the middle or below the whole thing, as I'll show you in a minute, that allows for that cryptographic verification to go on. And that's the secret to making the verifiable um, credential ecosystem. That's the basic idea. Now, it will, uh, I want to bring it home because with the advent of COVID, suddenly we have uh, an enormous demand has, has emerged very quickly for digital credentials that can help us with... Um, uh, dealing with uh, with COVID, with with how we're going to uh, prove uh, about tests and vaccinations when they're available, how we're going to start to reopen the economy and uh, for essential workers and others who need to prove uh, um, their health status to be able to do so quickly and easily in many different locations. And so this article was in CoinDesk uh, a little over a month ago. Um, where uh, it's talking about a new initiative. Um, they, they unfortunately called it the immunity passport, and that term's been somewhat controversial. But behind it, uh, it was basically, uh, this is some information from it, um, explaining, hey, 
digital credentials, one of the first things we can do it is do with it is start to use them to uh, uh, prove things uh, about our health and uh, our uh, vaccination or, or um, uh, testing related to, to COVID. So that led to an initiative uh, that the article is about called COVID Credentials Initiative, CCI. This is a list of 10 of the different use cases. I think they're up to 12 that they're developing. Uh, it's just a worldwide volunteer effort. It involves over, I think it's 350 people now, over 100 companies to develop these credentials, uh, a framework for these credentials so they can be implemented all over the world in an interoperable way. The very first one on that list is the least controversial and, and most practical. Um, how can a doctor or nurse prove they are a doctor or nurse and quickly move around a bunch of different facilities? Turns out there's a really good example of where they need that, and that's in the UK, the National Health Service, where it's called uh, the doctor's passport, a digital passport. This is an article that appeared um, uh, in March about that, uh, and uh, expect to read a lot more about that as it's rolled out. In the UK, again, it's a doctor, nurse, with a smart, uh, uh, a doctor's passport credential on a uh, digital wallet. Their smartphone is able to walk into a, uh, an NHS facility anywhere in the country, scan a barcode, authorize the uh, sharing that credential, and within seconds, green light turns on. The doctor's uh, off to do. That's a process that can take uh, uh, up to several hours to check manually to make sure it's a real doctor or nurse that's uh, able to come into that hospital. And they estimate, I think it was 45,000 doctor days a year can be saved by moving to this technology, which means those doctors get all that time with patients. And that can make a big difference when we're talking about something like COVID. So hopefully that gives you a nice tangible example of like, wow, this is a technology that can make a difference in one of the biggest pandemics uh, and, and scourges that we're, we're dealing with uh, as a society today. Now let's get down into some of the nitty gritty. So how do these work? What's the underlying technology we need to make this uh, happen? And what else do we need to make it successful in the market? So here's a different way to look at the trust triangle. And um, I, I've broken it down into these sort of tinker toy like pieces because I'm going to step you through how it actually works. First, the issue with the credential, they're going to uh, uh, start the cryptographic uh, infrastructure here by they generate a key pair and then they create what's called a DID, which in, in, in some cases is actually then generated from the key pair. Um, in some cases, it's similar to a hash of the, of the public key as it's used on Bitcoin. But there are various different ways to do it, and they're all called did methods, different did methods. But they choose a did method, and then they write uh, the DID and the public key and any other metadata to a public blockchain, or Verifold Data Registry is a generic term. Once they've done that, then they're set up now, and with the private key, they can start issuing verifiable credentials, literally a digital document that they're then going to sign with the private key associated with that. The DID of the issuer, which is effectively the address of this, um, uh, what's called the did document on the blockchain, that DID is in this credential. It's the identifier for the issue that's in the credential. That goes into the holder's wallet. Now the holder goes to a verifier, say a TSA agent at an airport, and needs to present a proof of that credential. Let's say it's a, it's a passport and they just need to present, I have a proof of a valid passport and maybe in one of the following uh, countries. That's all the verifier needs to know. Verifier requests that proof. The proof, uh, uh, the, the holder's uh, digital wallet, what we'll call the agent for that, produces that proof. And it contains the DID for the issuer. So the verifier knows, is that an issuer I trust? The verifier uses that DID to read this uh, public key and metadata and then verify the credential, uh, the proof, that the proof is cryptographically valid, whatever it is they need to know. And the, the real breakthrough in this process, besides the fact it's all done uh, with cryptography, is that there is no integration at all needed between the verifier and the issuer. Issuer can issue a credential holder, any verifier in the world, let's say it was a passport, any site in the world can say, oh, can you show me a valid passport? As long as the verifiers know the DIDs of passport issuers, we'll talk about that in a minute, then they can get a cryptographic proof that you have a valid passport or of any um, uh, attribute or they call them claims on that passport. Imagine a site where you don't have to just you know, prove that you're even a real person. You can prove you have a passport. And the verifiers do not have to integrate at all with the issuers. They just have to know what's the DID of an issuer that I trust. And uh, so that's the basic idea of verifiable credentials, which are at the heart of this whole thing. Now let's walk through this with that NHS 
passport example so you can it, it really understand. Okay, in that case, the issuer is the National Health Service in the UK. Okay, they have written uh, uh, DIDs for each of the um, for the in their initial uh, trial, uh, they issued a set for a, a group of hospitals that were in the in the position then to um, issue this doctor's passport credential, which they would now sign with the private keys, each of them their own private key, to the holder that would be the doctor. The doctor now needs to produce a proof of their license when they go to a hospital in the NHS system. That proof will contain the DID of the issuer. And so uh, the hospital used that to read it from the sovereign blockchain to get that public key uh, and other metadata. They will then be able to verify, yeah, that, that is a real proof of a doctor's license uh, from uh, issued by the NHS. And because they trust the NHS, it's a go. It's a green light. And again, this whole thing takes a couple seconds um, to verify, just like verifying a mobile boarding pass when you're getting on board a plane. The user ceremony is almost identical. So that's that's the basics of how it works. Now, there are a couple... There's a couple more things here that are, uh, you know, part of the reason folks are so excited about this because it's not just about proof of identity. This gets into into all kinds of trusted communications, and here's one of the reasons. In this whole uh, example that we've uh, we've given here for you, only the issuer needed to have a DID to have to do a transaction with a blockchain to to use that as a decentralized repository for its public key, a, a verifiable repository for its public key and other metadata. The holder in this scenario has not needed to do that. Now, holders can also have public DIDs and they can use them to, to sign things like, like proofs or other digital documents. But when they do that, if they're using a public DID, then that DID and the signature that, of every document that they, they sign with it, every uh, proof, is going to be a tracking beacon. Uh, it's going to be like l using your social security number to sign everything that you do. The approach is to say, let's not do public DIDs for holders. Let's take an approach where um, there's a different kind of DID that's called a pairwise or a peer DID, um, uh, private pairwise peer DIDs. So peer DIDs are uh, same thing. They're an address for a public key and the other metadata associated uh, with a, uh, a cryptographic relationship. But peer DIDs are ex exchanged uh, pairwise between any two parties in a process that uh, if you're deep into crypto is, is basically uh, a protocol around Diffie-Hellman key exchange. But you're not just exchanging the public keys, you're exchanging the DID documents so that once you've done that, you can actually now do key rotation. One party can change its keys and send a message about a key rotation event to the other one, and they can update the keys and know that it cryptographically it's secure. So pairwise DIDs um, allow these two parties to set up a relationship. Those the public keys and the DIDs do not need to go onto a, um, a public blockchain. They're just shared between those two parties or between a group uh, of any size. Um, and so holder and issuer form a relationship and uh, issuer wants to issue credentials securely to the holder. That happens over this peer DID uh, connection is the name for it. Um, when the holder goes to verifier, they also form a connection. They exchange peer DIDs. All these peer DIDs stay off ledger and all the credentials that are exchanged here don't touch a ledger. They are all take place privately so that this resulting infrastructure can be compatible with any privacy or data protection uh, uh, regulations around the world, including GDPR. And uh, Sovereign Foundation spent a year in, uh, you know, doing a GDPR analysis to make sure this infrastructure would be compatible or, or fulfill GDPR privacy requirements. So it is really, we call it privacy by design writ large uh, at internet scale. It's highly private data exchange that's all cryptographically verifiable. And these connections, again, there you can form anywhere, any two peers. So you can have uh, any peer in this infrastructure will typically, they'll all be holders, many will be verifiers, and a great number will be issuers. Even individuals will be issuers of digital credentials. Think of a business card. That's your information. Think of your, your, you know, your eating food preferences, your clothing sizes. Those are belong to you. You're the issuer of those credentials. 